Good evening. The hour is late and I'm getting tired, but I told you I would do two videos tonight. This Friday, there's going to be a test. And I know that all of you can do well on this test. You just have to put your heads down, study hard, review the PowerPoint, look at all the videos, teach it to your, your parents, teach it to your friends, and I know it will all be okay. With that in mind, I'd like to use the music of Forrest Gump to run very quickly through all the different powers of the president. And I'd like to organize it in three different ways. I'd like to talk about the unofficial powers of the president. I'd like to talk about the domestic powers, what he can do within the country, and also finally his foreign policy powers. So first of all, let's start off with the unofficial powers. Uh, let me uh, Marco Rubio uh, this with us just for a second. Um, the very first power of the unofficial powers, of course, is the one that we've already talked about in a previous video, and that would be using what Teddy Roosevelt called the bully pulpit, making a direct appeal to the public, uh, using the power of the presidency to communicate directly to the American people in order to put pressure on Congress to kind of bend to the will and the agenda of the president. We talked all about that already, but that is probably the most important unofficial power of the president. Another unofficial power, and by unofficial we mean unenumerated in the Constitution, it's not in Article 1 and Article 2, uh, would be the executive privilege. And that's this idea which was kind of first proposed by Nixon, this notion that the president and his advisors have a zone of privacy and that Congress can't subpoena every piece of paper and document and conversation. Uh, and of course, uh, Nixon didn't want to hand over certain materials during the Watergate investigation and went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in U.S. versus Nixon, the Supreme Court did in fact find that there is an executive privilege, but it's limited really to most of the time to, to issues of national security. Uh, now, another unofficial power is the power of signing statements, where the president will sign a law into power, but he'll attach uh, a signing statement saying, here's how I interpret this law. Uh, sometimes he'll even say straight out, I'm not going to enforce certain provisions of the law that I just signed. Uh, and then finally, the last unofficial power is that the president is uh, the party leader. And as party leader, he sets the agenda, he raise a tr raises a tremendous amount of money. Uh, that's why it's always kind of an advantage to be the president, right? Uh, if you're in the party of the president, because you know who your leader is. The leader of the Democrats is Barack Obama. The leader of the Republicans uh, for years was George W. Bush. Now, you know, the Republican Party is essentially without a rudder right now. I'm not exactly sure who the leader is, especially right now, this moment, as you have two factions of the party trying to grab the mantle of power and, and be the spokesperson uh, for the Republican Party. So being a party leader is an important unofficial power of the president. Now, let's talk about domestic powers. Obviously, the president enforces laws and implements programs. Uh, that is probably the most important thing the president does. He also has the power to convene Congress when necessary. Now, don't forget that that's very different than uh, the State of the Union. The, uh, the, the State of the Union is a constitutionally mandated address, or it doesn't have to be a speech. Woodrow Wilson made it into a speech. Uh, just a report to Congress, but uh, convening Congress is, is an important power. Uh, also, making nominations. We'll talk about that a lot more next unit when we get to the judiciary. But all these very important positions in government, uh, all the judges, all the secretaries, all the ambassadors, all the directors and, and agency heads, they all get there in the same way, and that's the president nominates them. But this is a shared power, Article 2, Section 2, advise and consent. The Senate has to confirm all the presidential nominees. The president also has the power to pardon, which is a very uh, unchecked power that the president has. Um, and, you know, of course, the most famous one is Ford pardoning Nixon. And then finally, I think the most important power when it comes to lawmaking would be the veto power. Um, and the president can inject himself into the lawmaking process simply by threatening a veto. And there are three different vetoes you should know about. The traditional veto where the president just says, no, I don't like this law, I'm going to send it back to Congress. And if you don't like it, override me by two-thirds, which is very tough to do. You have the pocket veto, which is where the president doesn't sign it or veto it. He does nothing. But because it's the last 10 days of a congressional term, it essentially has the, the effect of a veto. And then finally, you have the line item veto, which a lot of governors have, but the president doesn't. Uh, president Clinton had it for a while, but it was ultimately declared to be unconstitutional because when the president signs a bill but then takes out certain provisions of a law, the Supreme Court said that he's acting as a one-man legislature. So in Clinton versus the city of New York, the Supreme Court said no to that. <clears throat> Finally, let's talk about foreign policy powers, quite a few of them. You know, the power, obviously, to be commander-in-chief, the power to negotiate treaties, to create executive agreements. Um, all of these are, are very important powers. The most important one is the power of the commander-in-chief, and that's, I think, without a doubt, the most controversial element to the modern presidency. 
Again, the Founding Fathers said in Federalist Paper 69, they did not want to follow the European model. They did not want executive-initiated conflicts. Uh, for hundreds of years, Europe thought about everything. Religion, conquest, territory, you name it. And so they wanted to make sure that you couldn't have, you know, a monarch or a king or an individual who never had to fight in the war, never had to have, pay for the war, didn't want these people to, fight, to, to, to decide if we should go to war. So they split war-making powers into two. The president wages the war, but the Congress decides if the war should be fought in the first place. That's why they have the power to declare war. They also have the power to fund the war. They also have the power to raise an army or a navy. So war-making powers in our system of, of government is absolutely split in two between the Congress and the president. The question is, since the president is commander-in-chief of the armed forces, how much can he command the armed forces to do without any kind of congressional permission? Uh, and a constitutional purist might say the president can't do anything. Uh, without a kind of declaration or at least a resolution from Congress, and yet we know that that hasn't the way that it's worked out. Uh, we've only declared war five times in this country, and yet we have over 200 conflicts uh, using the military uh, since the beginning of the country. I mean, look in the last 50 years. Vietnam, the Persian Gulf War, uh, Afghanistan, the Iraq War, uh, Libya, none of these things were, 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 uh, were declarations from Congress, and Libya wasn't even given permission from Congress in any meaningful way. So what happened in the 1970s is Congress created the War Powers Act of 1973, largely in response to the fact that Nixon bombed Cambodia without any kind of congressional permission. And what happened was this, the, 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 the Congress said two things. One, you have 48 hours, Mr. President, to notify us that you've deployed troops in some fashion. We're not asking you to get permission from us, but we are telling you that you need to notify us. The second big thing that you need to do, and this is probably the part that might be unconstitutional and every president since Nixon has said that it's unconstitutional, is that the Congress said that the president has to get some kind of permission, could be a declaration or a resolution, within 60 days of deploying troops or the troops have to come home. Now, of course, George H.W. Bush said, I'm going to Iraq. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go. You know, of course, the Ira Iraqis, uh, you know, the Fedahin and the Republican Guard of the Iraqi army, they had, they had already conquered uh, Kuwait and they were lining up on the border of Saudi Arabia. And George H.W. Bush said, we're going to go and do something about this, uh, even if I don't get congressional permission. Now, he ultimately got congressional permission. The President Obama didn't get any permission for Libya. 60 days came. And what happened? What happened? The answer, absolutely nothing. So who knows how powerful the War Powers Resolution is? Of course, the President can also negotiate treaties, but again, they are ratified by the Senate with a two-thirds vote. Very famously, the Senate refused to ratify Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations in the late 19, uh, late 19 teens. Uh, and also, the President can create executive agreements, and I'll let you look that up on your own. It's a little bit different than, uh, than a treaty. Okay, I hope this is helpful. I'll see you next time.